from 2 Corinthians 12, um, verse 9. And this is Paul speaking. And Paul was, he went through a whole lot for his faith. Um, And the verse says, But he, God, said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. And I've always read that verse, and it's really easy to kind of use it as a Christian cliche, but there's a lot going on there if you take it into pieces. Um, So the first thing that says is that God's power is greatest when we're at our weakest, which I don't know about you, but that takes a whole load off my shoulders. (laughs) It's like, okay, at least if I'm not (laughs) being great here, at least God is great. Um, And moreover, um, it even talks about that God gets all the glory. When we're not enough, that means God is doing something big, and he can show up in big ways. Um, And it also talks about that God is our deliverer, that we can't do this alone without God. And it calls on us to trust him, to know that we're not going to be enough, and we're definitely not going to be perfect. But God's grace is sufficient for us. And so with that, I'd love you guys to stand and join us in reflecting on that as we sing.
All righty. While you're standing, um, there's actually a responsive reading to help us change tones a little bit and focus a little bit more on the trust and relationship we have with God. Teach me your decrees, O Lord. I will keep them to the end. Give me understanding, and I will obey your instructions, and I will put them into practice with all of my heart. Make me walk along the path of your commands, for that is where my happiness is found. Give me an eagerness for your laws rather than a love of money. Turn my eyes from worthless things and give me life through your word. Reassure me of your promise made to those who fear you. Help me abandon my shameful ways, for your regulations are good. I long to obey your commandments. Renew my life with your goodness. Amen.
thank you for your grace when we haven't been enough. Your grace is enough, God, and it's enough for us to love you and to follow you with all our hearts. Please open our, our, our eyes and our hearts to your word today, Lord, and what you, your will for our lives is. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Welcome to Christ Church. My name is John. I'm the pastor here at Christ Church, and we are a strategic partner of Grace Chapel in Lexington on a mission to celebrate people, pursue wholeness, and discover God. If this is your first time with us today, we're really glad that you could make it, and we would love it if you took a moment and grabbed one of our Connect cards in the pockets in front of you. Fill that out and drop it by our Welcome Center after service. This gives us a chance to get to know you a little bit and know how we can be praying for you throughout the week. Uh, we have a gift for you at our Welcome Center afterwards if you drop that by as well. Just a few announcements coming up, some things coming up at Christ Church. Uh, first of all, we have our Night of Worship this Friday. We have a big game coming up too. <laughs> Our night of worship this Friday. Uh, join Christians from around the Sauhegan Valley where a lot of the local churches are gathering together to worship and praise God. Uh, our own Jesse is leading that together. Are we on? Nope. <coughs> Test one, two. Test. Okay, we'll try to get that fixed in a minute. But uh, the night of worship is at 7 p.m. In, at this uh, Sauhegan Valley High School, and we encourage you and invite you to join us for that great event. Uh, the CCA Men's Ministry is holding an event this Saturday called the Timothy Project at 9 a.m. It's meeting right here from 9 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. to give men a framework for coming alongside and sharing wisdom with other men. This is an opportunity to take a close look at how the Apostle Paul shared, shared his life experience with Timothy and considered how we might do the same. Um, a light breakfast will be provided for that, and we encourage you to sign up for that at the Welcome Center after service as well. Uh, we want to just remind you about our prayer wall during our Lenten season. That's out in our fellowship hall towards the restrooms, right across from the restrooms. Uh, we'll be praying for, through some of your prayer requests with you throughout this Lenten season. I encourage you to stop by and fill something, put, a, put your prayer requests on the board there. We also uh, are in a season where we're just a kind of reflecting and rediscovering Jesus. And as part of that, uh, with our partnership with Grace, uh, we're reading along with them the book, Rediscover Jesus. If you'd like to participate with us in that, you can pick up a copy of that for $2 at the Welcome Center. And finally, we just want to remind you from time to time that we have a share bin, a share box out in our foyer. And this is an opportunity for us to give to the food pantry in Milford and, and contribute to those who have needs in our local area. Uh, this month, some of the needs are canned fruit, canned pasta, juice, coffee, and tea. We have a lot of other things going on uh, to hear about some more events and some of the things happening at Christchurch. We encourage you to sign up for our news and notes. You can do that through the Connect card or like us on Facebook. I'm going to invite up a special guest that we have today with us, uh, Cindy Thomas, if you want to come on up. Some of these have buttons. On the side. On the side. There we go. Okay. Cindy is uh, the director of Safe Families. We here are a Safe Family church, and Safe Families is an organization that helps prevent kids from going into foster care who are in crisis situations, crisis family situations, and also helps keep families together during that process. Uh, Cindy's just going to share a story of, of some success that they've had with safe families. Thank you. So um, things are definitely in crisis in New Hampshire. Um, in the last four years, the number of kids coming into foster care has doubled. Primarily, it's the opioid and the homelessness that's driving it. Well, Safe Families is a prevention program where the church comes alongside and helps families that are in crisis. Um, we do it by um, some people will become a host family like Kristen and Richard have, where they've taken in, you can take in children or some families take in the mom and the kids. Um, or we haven't had a dad yet, but that's possible too. And we also um, ask other people within the church to really come alongside and love their neighbor like God called us to do, to be hospitable, to open our hearts and our home. And uh, most of the people we help have no support system at all. Um, we recently helped a mom with three kids that have been really struggling um, for quite a few years. And she um, 
was trying to hold three jobs down to support herself, pay for child care, pay for housing and her car payment. And she found herself homeless and the child care went up and she couldn't afford the child care and she came and knocked on our door. And we had a family that took her in for about three to four months and they actually consider her extended family now. The kids call them grandma and grandpa. They were just with them about three, a little over three months and now she's in her own place going back to school, going to college. She's working full time and those kids are safe and those kids know they loved. And she can't believe she struggled for about eight years um, with these children and trying to um, help them with food and just keep them safe and um, it was so desperate she got to the point that she showed up at our office and was thinking about giving her kids up because she couldn't put them through it anymore that's how much she loves those kids but when the church stepped in and came alongside and wrapped around her it made a huge difference we have another young mom we're helping right now um, that's with one of our host homes and she has two children and she has never, ever had a safe home. Her mom died when she was four. Her dad was into alcohol and drugs, bounced around, and was in foster care for a while, back home with dad. And one of the things she said to me, like she's just, whenever she's with a family or with somebody, she feels like she's never really welcome there. She has never really felt stable. Well, well, what a difference it makes when people come alongside and she knows she doesn't have to worry about feeding her kids anymore. She's going back to college, trying to get some um, classes so she can um, get a better job and be able to support those kids. She's been able to, she didn't even have enough money to renew her license. So we were able to help her um, by not having to worry about housing and all that stuff that she could get her license back and she now has a car. And um, so just things that, I mean, it makes a huge difference. So most of the moms we're helping, um, it's, they're really struggling. And we've helped um, people that have had cancer that had nobody to watch their kids so they could go have their cancer surgery. So sometimes it's just a couple of days or a week that we take in the children. Sometimes it might be longer if we're taking in a mom um, with some kids. We help them get stabilized and back on their feet again. So we would ask if you want to be a family friend um, that provides child care, transportation, helps the host family when the kids go back home, might come alongside and help with some things that mom or dad need, um, or a mentor to mom or dad to help them through whatever they're going through, homelessness, whatever it is they are, if it's a crisis or divorce, um, joblessness. And also um, resource friends that help support the program. So we do have little house banks here today, too, because we work all off of donations. And we don't charge for any of our services, and we help anyone in need. Um, so we have little house banks here. If you'd like to help support the program, that would be wonderful. You can take them home and bring them back in three weeks, and we'll collect them. Um, and just put loose change or whatever God leads you to help. Um, we don't get any funding from the state or federal at all for this program. It's a church-led ministry. So we do count on the donations from the church. But more we count on people in the church that just want to love like Jesus did to help these families in crisis and make a difference. So thank you so much. Well, I'll be out here um, after services if you have questions or if you want to um, just sign up or get more information. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cindy. Why don't you give her a welcome? Cindy, as uh, we've loved having Cindy here, and uh, for a couple of years now, we've been a partner with Safe Families, and not only has Safe Families given us an avenue to help reach out to people in need and, and touch people in our community, really Safe Families has touched us and transformed us in so many ways, so thank you for what you do, and please, uh, if you get a chance after service, stop by in the foyer and talk to Cindy and get to know a little bit more about the program. human mind is an amazing thing. And I'm always wondering as I watch my little 10-month-old develop, 
what in the world is going on in that little mind of hers? We've recently just entered a new stage of parenting, and I think a good name for it would be the attachment phase. Basically, what that means is if a baby is in anybody's arms besides mom, dad included, uh, and if she sees mom, she's going to try to take a nosedive towards mom, so it makes you have to be a little bit extra careful at times. If you happen to be in the same room as mom is and you have baby in your arms and mom starts to walk out or leave the room, baby's going to test her vocal cords and it's amazing the range that a little child can have. <laughs> but you know, it's a, it's, great, it's a great feeling to feel loved and appreciated and wanted as a parent. But at the same time, I see my child react the same way to some of her toys, so I'm not sure that it's really that big of a, <laughs> really that big of a thing at all. It starts out young and it's kind of cute, but it really, it continues on when we're older in life. There's that feeling that we have, that fear that we have that we're going to lose something that we care about a lot. And the truth is we all experience loss at times. We, we lose our car keys when, when we're when we're far away from home and experience the anxiety and the, and the, um, the, the disturbance and, and just the, the difficulty of what it feels like to be far away from home and not having access to your means of getting to different places. Perhaps you've lost your way in the New Hampshire wilderness wondering if you're going to be able to find your way to the other end or find your way out when you're climbing to the top of a mountain. Or maybe, perhaps you're in a season where you've just experienced the loss of a job, the loss of work, and maybe you're just a little bit uncertain about what's gonna happen next. Where is God gonna lead me in this? These result, these kind of losses make us ask questions like that. God, where are you at in all this? How are we gonna get through this mess? One of the most difficult losses that we deal with is is the loss of, of people that we love. And that can take on all sorts of different shapes and, and forms. That could take on the shape of, of seeing a close friend or a cr- close loved one move away a, a long distance, perhaps across the country. And while we often anticipate we're going to, that we're going to maintain that close connection and we're gonna foster that friendship, and sometimes we're able to do that often as we grow, And as we grow apart, as we grow in our own ways, we tend to grow apart. And those relationships aren't the same that they that they used to be. It can happen too uh, when we when we experience conflicts at various times that end 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 up in breaks in relationships. I recently had a conversation with somebody who who experienced that in church leadership. They they described the the experience with one word, divorce. It was like the, the leaders had experienced such, such uh, awesome ministry experiences and seen God do amazing things together. They had intimate conversations with one another. And all of a sudden, because of the break that happened in ministry, they felt like they were strangers living next door to each other. It can happen, it can happen with a disability of a loved one or memory loss of a loved one too. I still vividly remember, I still vividly remember visiting my dad's twin for one of the last times in the nursing home. He was only 55, but memory loss had taken a hold of him. Uh, my uncle was one of the most joyful, carefree people that you would have ever met. He was a custodian in the veterans' home, and every year he faithfully on National Smile Day would dress up like a clown and carry stickers to all the residents with his, uh, as he wheeled his cart down the hallway. But I remember watching his memory decline, and one of the last times that I saw him, he didn't even remember who his, or know who his godson was. And that leaves us asking questions. That leaves us asking hard questions. God, where are you at in all this? Where am I supposed to go? Sometimes we find that these questions are, are vexing and not having the answer to the why or the where can often just, just leave us paralyzed. It's like everything is going really well and then suddenly the bottom, it just drops out on us. How can our hearts 
find peace when we are on the precipice or aftermath of loss? How can our hearts find peace when we so often find ourselves on the precipice or the aftermath of loss? In our sermon series on prayer, we've been looking at some of the ways that that the disciples and people interacted with Jesus and how he invited really special kinds of interaction, cries out for help, cries out for mercy. And today we're gonna look at another one of those and we're gonna look at a specific time in the life and ministry of Jesus when he told his disciples, I'm going away and you can't come with me. And how he brought hope into a vexing and very difficult situation. As we open God's word to John chapter 13, verses 31 through John chapter 14, verses 14, in the tradition that we've kind of had during this Lenten season, I'm going to ask you to stand. But this is a long passage, so please, uh, if you feel feel uncomfortable or if uh, you're unable, please remain seated as we read these as we read these words. So please stand if you are able. John chapter 13, verses 31 is where we're starting. Now the Son of Man, Jesus said, is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself and will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give to you, love one another. As I have loved you, so must you love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, where I am going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I'll lay down my life for you. And Jesus answered, will you really Lay down your life for me. Very very truly I tell you, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe in me also. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. You know the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, from now on, you do know him and you have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father And that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip? Uh, Even after I have been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Uh, Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me or at least believe on on the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father, and I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. You may be seated. When scholars are reading John, uh, many scholars believe that John can be divided into two sections. John chapter one versus, John chapter one through John chapter 12 is often called the book of signs. It deals with the seven sign miracles that Jesus performs that invites the community to know him and demonstrates who he is to the broader community. After John chapter 12, when we get into John chapter 13, many scholars view this as the second part of the book and they call this the book of the glory, book of glory. This is where Jesus gets a little bit more intimate with his disciples and emphasizes the glory that's about to happen. In John chapter 13, 1, John writes that Jesus knew that his hour had now come. He didn't mean a literal hour. He was talking about a moment, a moment that involved his death, his resurrection, and all that that was involved. 
Jesus was on a mission to glorify God. That means that with all of his breath, with everything that he did, he desired to give attention to his father and make him look good by his actions, by his words, by, by his deeds. But now is coming the time when Jesus would be glorified. But our expectations of glorified are a little bit reversed because the way that God is going to glorify Jesus is by sending a betrayer. He's going to be betrayed. That's the first act of this moment of glorification. The second thing that's going to be happen that's going to be going to happen is Jesus is going to be lifted high in the sky to die on a cross. And only after all that will he be resurrected. This is what glory is. It's first humility. It's first stepping down. It's first bowing down to the Father and then being lifted up. Well, in all of this, this is Jesus kind of his farewell discourse. And we see, and we see this happen in the Bible several times. Moses gave a farewell discourse. Jacob gave a farewell discourse. Even Paul gave a farewell discourse in Acts chapter 22 to the Ephesians when he knew that he wouldn't be seeing them any longer. It's a common thing to see in the Bible. And in, in Jesus' farewell discourse, he covers three things. His glorification, which we talked about. Then he talks about his departure. He tells the disciples, I'm going to a place you cannot come. And then another thing that's common in this kind of genre, we see a commissioning. When Moses left, when Jacob left, they commissioned the people that were following after them to do something specific, to act and behave in a specific way. And Jesus leaves them with one command. This is probably the most important part. He tells them, love one another as I have loved you. Now, Jesus calls this a new command, and that's really not a new command. We see that in the Old Testament, to love one another. But what's new about it is the extent which his disciples were expected to love one another. They, they were expected to love one another in a bolder, brighter, bigger, and wider way. Because not only were they just to love one another, they were to love one another in the way that Jesus loved them. Preceding this chapter, Jesus washed their feet and he said, I am the master and I am the teacher. Does the master wash a person's feet? And not normally was that something that would happen, but Jesus bowed down and he washed their feet without asking anything in return of them. That kind of love was foreshadowing the cross. And that's the kind of love that Jesus was inviting his disciples to participating in. A new kind of love that was bolder, bigger, and brighter. But you know what I think? I don't think that the disciples probably heard a word about that, <laughs> at least not initially. Because Jesus said that he was going away and that they couldn't come with him, and that rocked their world. It was probably really similar to going for a job evaluation, and your boss says, you know what, I'm going to tell you five things that you did really well, and I'm going to tell you one thing you can improve on. When you're walking away from that meeting, I can tell you what, you don't have the five things that you did really well on your mind. You usually have the one thing that you can improve on that's stuck with you. But this is a level up because this is a kick in the gut. This man, this amazing person who the disciples have just spent three years of their life with says, I'm going, and where I'm going, you can't come. So what happens next is the disciples, three of them come up, one, two, three, one right after the other, and they ask Jesus questions. Each has a question. Actually, the third one's not really a question, but there's an implied question involved in that. They ask him questions, and they're really reasonable, good questions based upon what Jesus said. But I think actually there is a question behind those questions based upon the way that Jesus answers them. Often we do that. We have a question that's the surface, face value question, but there's really something deeper, a deeper fear or concern behind those. And we want to look at those. We want to look at those as we as we consider how we can respond to loss and how Jesus invites us to respond to loss as well. The first one is, is good old Peter. He's usually first up to bat. It's Peter, he asks this in John chapter 13. Lord, where are you going? Now, what's funny about that is Jesus, he doesn't really answer his question. Jesus replies and he says, where I am going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. He doesn't tell Peter where he's going. Is Jesus toying with Peter? Is he just playing with him? I, 
Uh, I think that there's actually a purpose. Jesus knows that the real question isn't where are you going? The real question that Peter has is can we come with you and maybe if we go a little bit step deeper, are you leaving us alone? Are you leaving us alone? Are you leaving us? Chances are that's, that's a question that maybe you've had as well. At the, at the root of some of our concerns and our fear of loss is a fear of loneliness. And we've talked about loneliness a lot here, and we'll probably talk about loneliness more in the future. And, and the reason that we do is because in the 21st century, in, in this particular location, we don't experience a lot of the sufferings that Christians have in other times and Christians do in other places. But loneliness here, it's like an epidemic. And we've all experienced it at different times in our lives in different, in different ways. Loneliness is such a problem that it, it creeps into places that we wouldn't expect it to come, like the church, like marriages. It's something that even hits people who are introverts, who, who prefer not to spend too much time with people, but they still feel really lonely sometimes. Loneliness makes the sting of loss all the worse. So we can empathize, we can feel with Peter as, as he asks this question. But Peter, he doesn't like what Jesus has to say. <laughs> so Peter says this, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I'll lay down my life for you. But Jesus doesn't like Peter's tone. So Jesus answers, will you really lay down your life for me? You can, you can sense how incredulous he is at Peter's statement. Peter, will you really lay down your life for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the, the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. But Jesus pauses, I imagine, and sighs because his heart is compassionate. And he, he feels for Peter. He understands his real question. So Jesus continues and he says this. I imagine that he just put his arm on Peter's shoulder. He looks at Peter, he looks at his disciples, and he says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you that I am going there to prepare, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you may also be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Now, if you have questions what that means to be in the Father's house that has many rooms, you're not alone. And that question is going to come up next. And we'll come back to that. But Jesus' point in the heart of his answer to address Peter is this. I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. Now Jesus didn't promise that he would never be gone, at least not here. It's fascinating when we try to take a bigger look at scripture, at the, at the very end of Matthew when Jesus leaves, he says, he says, I will be with you always until the very end of the age. If we look just a couple chapters later in John, what we're going to find is Jesus promises another advocate, the Holy Spirit, to come and, and fill some of the place that Jesus will leave. But he doesn't do that here. He doesn't tell them, don't worry, I'm going to be with you, I'm here, I'm here. He recognizes and doesn't dismiss that they will be, in some ways at least, alone and, and not with his physical presence. He doesn't try to whitewash it. He doesn't try to make it look good. But there is, a, there is a difference between absence and abandonment. There's a difference between absence and abandonment. Uh, Jesus is going to be absent for a time, but, he, but he's not abandoning his disciples because his promise is that I am going to come back and I am going to take you. I'm going to take you with me. I'm going to take you with me. I'm going to come back. That's the first question. That's the first answer. But another apostle by the name of Thomas, who many know as Doubting Thomas, he steps up to the plate next. And here's what Thomas says. Thomas says to him, 
Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? We don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? I think Thomas's real question here is, Lord, where are you taking us? God, where are you taking us in all this? It's a question that, that, that we have as well, often, when we struggle and we, we think that we had a certain plan in life and, and we expected things to work out a certain way to God, that God would lead us in a certain direction and all of a sudden things take a 180 and, and go the opposite direction. God, where are, where are you taking us? in all of this. And Jesus clarifies. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him. You have seen him. Let's take just one step back to what Jesus said earlier about my Father's house has many rooms. Throughout Christian history, this has often been ter- interpreted as a picture of heaven. When we get to heaven up there on the cloud, we're going to be, we're going to have these great big mansions with many, many rooms, a big, big house. I think there was a song about it. <laughs> but what Jesus probably means is not, he's not probably actually referring to a physical location here. Let me give you, let me give you a few reasons why. First of all, he clarifies it and he says, to the Father to the Father in John 14, 6. Uh, Secondly, he says, this is going to happen when he comes back. And that language most often refers to when he returns at his second coming, at the very end of the age. Thirdly, in the Gospel of John, Jesus never talks about heaven as a destination. (coughs) Jesus talks about the resurrection of, the resurrection of all people as a destination, when at the end of time, all of the dead will be raised when he comes back and they'll experience physical bodies, not some soul floating on the cloud, but a physical reality to be enjoyed in the future. And finally, the final reason I don't think that this is actually describing a place is that special word rooms in the Greek is a Greek word called mone. And it's in a family of words that is actually one of John's favorite words. And we see that translated as abide or remain. It's a relationship word. What Jesus is talking about here is a relationship. The question of our final destination is not so much a question of place, it's a question of who. It's not a question of where, it's a question of who. It's it's an invitation primarily to a relationship with God, a relationship with the creator of the universe, a soul-satisfying, meaningful creation relationship with God. That's where we're going, Thomas. That's where we're going. Now, Thomas probably had some fears when he heard this because the, the, my father's house is used in John to talk about the temple. And the temple was in hostile territory. But Jesus wasn't talking about a place. He was talking about a person and a relationship with that person. Well, we have one more questioner that comes up to bat, Philip. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father. Show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Now, that's not a question, but I think that there's a question behind it. Maybe it would be better expressed like this. Lord, uh, just show us the Father, and that'll be enough for us. (laughs) That'll be just fine. That seems a little bit strange sometimes in our context, because in our modern context, we... We, we view God as loving and, and kind and compassionate. And all those things are true. But we have a hard time holding those things as compatible with a God who is, who is strong, who is just, who is majestic. Sometimes those things feel like oil and water and they just don't seem to fit that well together. But in God, they're held together with perfect balance and perfect truth. So Philip is a little bit afraid, and that's not unlike many characters in the, in the Bible as well. When the Israelites were given an option of whether they could listen to God directly or listen to God through Moses, they said, Moses, you speak for God because if we listen to him, we're going to die. They didn't want to die. <laughs> they were afraid because of God's greatness, his majesty, his, his justice. And I think a good picture of it is 
if you've ever been, or even if you've just seen pictures of the Grand Canyon. When you step up to the edge of the Grand Canyon, and maybe it's during a, a sunrise, you see, you see light bathe against the wall, and you see all these multiple beautiful colors highlighted on these massive walls. And, and it's, it's, it's such a beautiful picture of God's mercy and his kindness. But as you get to the edge, you also feel vastness, greatness, and just a little bit of intimidation. Here's what, here's what Jesus' response to Philip is. I think it's fascinating. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you such a, such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show me the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. And he goes on. The Trinity is, is mysterious. There are many things that we're going to never unravel about the relationship between the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. But there are many things that we can know and Christians have held as true throughout the centuries. And one of those things that we can know is that each is a distinct person. They're all distinct persons. The Father is a distinct person. The Son is a distinct person. The Holy Spirit is a distinct person. The Father never died on the cross. They are always held as separate and distinct, but they are always also united and have the same divine nature and characteristics. So what Jesus is saying here is he's saying, Philip, you're afraid of the Father, but you're not afraid of me. I'm a perfect representation of the Father. I've welcomed you in. You're safe with me, Philip. I think the question behind Philip's statement is, is it safe? Is it safe? And Jesus' answer is, Philip, you, you feel safe around me. Everything that the Father is, is is pictured in who I am. What you're about to experience one day when you encounter the Father fully is safety, goodness, wholeness, all of that. Is he safe? He's safe. In response to the fear and reality of Jesus, of law, in response to the fear and reality of loss, Jesus reminds his disciples that he's not abandoned them. He's, he's bringing them to someone special and that someone special is good and safe. In response to the reality of fear and loss, Jesus reminds his disciples that that he hasn't abandoned them, he's bringing them to someone special, and that someone special is safe and good. If we just take a step back from this and consider this in light of, of prayer, I think that there's also a lesson for us as well. In response to hard questions about being alone, about direction, about being safe, Jesus helped his disciples to change their perspective Embrace God's direction and experience hope. Asking God unfiltered questions gives him an opportunity to ease our troubled hearts. Asking God unfiltered questions gives us an opportunity for God to ease our troubled hearts. I think he does that in three ways. When we ask God unfiltered questions, it gives him the opportunity to ease our troubled hearts by by changing our perspective. Bill and Donna Farron have been a part of this church almost since its outset. And I had the chance to have a little bit of a conversation with, with Bill just a couple days ago. And, and he, he, he told me a story about a time when he felt God was leading him in a specific direction. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden there was a 180, kind of a crisis of, of what's God doing here? What, what's happening here? Bill and Donna lived here and attended Christ Church in about 2002, and uh, they had spent most of their adult life on the East Coast, but Donna grew up in Minnesota. And it just happened at about the time that their son was living in Minnesota as well. So Bill kind of kept an eye out on jobs in Minnesota because he wanted to show Donna, he wanted to express to her that her family mattered as well. 
It just so happened that a perfect job showed up. It was just the right fit. And, uh, and they took the opportunity to move out there. And God seemed to be working in this in so many, so many different ways. Their house sold right away. Uh, the salary was everything that they needed. They found a home on a lake. This was going to be their retirement home. This was going to be the place where they were going to be. Well, five years later, the job that Bill took, well, the whole program as a part of that company basically collapsed. It disappeared. Bill wasn't one to go to pastors because he hadn't had a whole lot of crises. He didn't, he didn't perceive to have a whole lot of crises in his life. So, but this felt different, and he had established a relationship with a pastor out there named Gordon, and he went to Gordon expecting, hoping for some advice, but expecting a normal kind of routine answer. Well, God is, you know, God, when God gives you his will, you just got to stick through it, and that's it. But Bill was surprised because Gordon said, Gordon said, I think that there's a whole cottage industry of preachers and teachers out there who say that, that, that God is fixed in his will and that you stick with the same thing for the entire season. But maybe, Bill, maybe this is just for a season. Maybe this is just for another reason. That advice meant a lot to Bill. And as they considered the steps that they should do next, they started to pray. And then God started to move, and God opened up a, a job that fit him back here in New England. Uh, he was 52, too young to retire. The, the economy was in a really bad place, but that job ended up buying his house after the crash and selling it for him. So everything enabled him to move back here. And strangely enough, his, his grandchildren and his son and his grandchildren uh, moved away from Minnesota in a couple years later. But as they reflected on it, there was something specific that happened in those very last days at the job that seemed to change Bill's perspective on the whole situation. His son Mike got a job at the company that he was working at. And Mike started to quickly elevate up the company. And as Bill and Donna were reflecting upon it afterwards, Bill said this, I think that we were, I think that God put us out there for Mike's sake, and not our own. Mike was able to start his career and move on and be successful and support his family. If we wouldn't have been out there, Mike wouldn't, may not have been in the place that he was at, but God wasn't moving us out to Minnesota for our sake. He was moving us out there for our son's sake. So God can bring us ease in the midst of loss by changing our perspective. But God can also bring us ease and comfort when we're on the precipice of loss or in the aftermath of loss by helping us to embrace our, our direction. To be honest with you, one of my character flaws and one of the things that I've been struggling with a lot lately is, is patience. And it's easy. It's easy for us to be glib about that, especially when we're in traffic there. We all feel, we all feel a little impatient at times. But impatience is a real problem because when we're impatient, when we're impatient, what we're saying is, I'm more important than you, and my time is more important than your time. So God had really been convicting me about this, and it had become clear because when I would lose time or run into some unforeseen problem, I'd experience a lot of frustration and a lot of disappointment. Well, I had a really good day on Friday. Start out with a two hour conversation with the IRS. You know this. <laughs> it ended up with a, a minor accident in Milford. It was, I left my blinker on in the wrong direction, and it's my bad. But the day was different because of all the things that God had already been doing and all the things that God was asking me to embrace in my life, anyways. Embrace these these uh, negative opportunities as, as, as chances to grow and become more whole. And, and the way that I would have normally responded wasn't the way that I responded that day. And you know what? It could have been worse. And it wasn't that bad of a day because I saw God's purpose, I saw his hand, and I saw his shaping hand in my life giving me a direction to pursue him and to become more like him. But finally, God can bring us ease in the midst of, he can ease our our hearts in the midst of loss when we ask him questions 
by giving us hope. By giving us hope. It's, it's easy for us in living in the 21st century in America to get, to get impatient with old things. We don't really like to watch old movies. I mean, some of you do, but you're kind of in a class of your own. Um, <clears throat> Um, most of us want the new thing, you know, the, I want the new phone, I want, the, I want to watch the new movie, I don't want to watch the old movies, I've seen them already, you know, what's new, what's fresh? And that's not necessarily a bad thing when it comes to the church, but it can be a bad thing when it, when it has to do with the most vital truths of the church. And we say when we hear a message, you know what, I heard that, I already know that message, I, it, it makes no difference, I already, it's, it's old news to me. But it's like, it's like eating our vegetables, you know, we don't say that about our vegetables, even though we may like to. Uh, we need to eat them on a regular basis because of the nourishment that they bring. And that's just as true with God's truth. The message may be old, but we need to continually feed on it to be nourished and to remain healthy. So sometimes in the midst of loss, when we cry out to God with our questions, he'll meet us with just a simple and basic reminder Maybe it's something as simple as this. God loves you. God loves you. Or maybe it's, or maybe it's something like, there will be justice, there will be justice, but not now. Maybe that simple truth is, is God forgives you. God forgives you. Or perhaps it's something like, God is not done with you yet. God is not done with you yet. How can, how can our hearts find peace when we're on the precipice or in the aftermath of loss? You know, the answer that God gives is not, I'm just going to make everything better right now. He often leaves us in troubling and difficult situations. But God's promise in the midst of those, in the midst of those questions is that he will incline his ear and listen to us and listen to our hearts in the midst of those troubles. And we can find peace in our hearts when we ask those questions and when we incline our ears in response. As we open up in prayer, I, I, just wanna, I just wanna ask some of those questions that we have and it might be on your heart. And I'm just gonna give some space for us to meditate and think about maybe how the Lord would respond. It's important for us to know how the Lord speaks to us and, and first of all, that starts with his word. Jesus says in the book of John that his, his sheep hear his voice and, and we, we wanna refresh ourselves and, and know his his word well so that we know how to recognize it because there's so many false voices. We have a good handle on that. We can sometimes often hear his voice speaking to us through impressions or, or visions or the like, or maybe, maybe other people will speak to us uh, God's word. Maybe we'll hear God's voice through other people. Maybe you're hearing God's voice right now. So as we just enter into a time of prayer, I would just like to create some pauses through those questions and would invite everyone to lower your heads and and close your eyes as we, as we consider God's answer and answers that, that may be coming to you in these important and difficult questions. <clears throat> Father, we want to start by recognizing that you are good, you're safe, you're kind, you're generous, you're faithful. Lord, we are a people that experiences trouble. And there may be some people here today that are thinking about the difficulties that they're going through, through, through maybe the loss of a job or, or perhaps, it's, perhaps it's the loss of a friend. God, why have you put us in this place? Why are we here? Lord, there are some of us here who, 
who've experienced maybe recently or, or will experience soon a change in direction that we didn't expect. Maybe we're here now because of, of a change of plans that we never could have anticipated. Maybe we'll be in another place, where, a place that we could have never expected. God, you lead in this way sometimes. Where do you want us to go? Where do you want us to go? Father, there are some people here who are experiencing just uh, loss in relationship. And sometimes it feels like you're not that close, that you're not really here. God, will you be here for us? Will you stick with us? Will you come back? And Father, finally, we want to ask, we want to ask, uh, how can we become the people that you want us to be? For those of us here who have experienced setback after setback, failure after failure, sometimes it feels like, sometimes it feels like that we can't win. Or how can we be the people that you want us to be? And will you help us be those kind of people? In Jesus' name. How could I doubt his tender mercy? Who through life has been my guide? All the way my Savior leads me, and cheers each winding path I tread. Gives me grace through every trial. Feeds me with the living bread. He leads us. You lead me and keep me from falling. You carry me close to your heart and show. Savior leads me All the fullness of His love All the sureness of His promise In the triumph of His blood When my spirit clothed in mortal Wings its fly to realms of day. This my song through endless ages. Jesus led me all the way. And Jesus led me all the way. You.
all the way my Savior leads me. All the way my Savior leads me. As we go ahead and close our service, we want to invite you to do a few things. First, we would love it if you had joined us for refreshments and fellowship out in our fellowship hall. We'll be having a welcome lunch in here, so we ask that everybody moves out into the foyer, a welcome lunch, and if you're visiting or if you've been visiting for a while, we'd love it if you attended that. Uh, we'll also have a couple elders up here for a few minutes for prayer for anything that God has put on your heart. And we also want to give you the opportunity to give. The Bible says that God loves a cheerful giver, and you can do that on the offering box at the back or by giving online at ccnh.org. Uh, chances are there's, you have a lot of questions for God. Um, not all of them are questions that God will necessarily answer, but there are some that God wants to bring healing to. So I encourage you throughout your day today and as you go about your week that you take some time to just bring some of your big and hard questions to God. Have a great week, and don't forget to look for opportunities to celebrate people, pursue wholeness, and discover God along the way.